I am not the person that you think I am I am not the person that you think that I should be I'm not the person that you think I am I am just a passenger You are not the person that you say you are You are not the person that has to try so hard You're not the person that you say you are You are just a passenger And it's a good ride most of the time It's a good ride We are not the people we pretend to be We are not the people living inside these screens We're not the people that we think we need We are all just passengers And it's a good ride most of the time It's a good ride Are you ready for the morning show? Oh, I said, are you ready? Come on, band. Come on now. Put your hands together for our own Reverend Harold. Costa. Oh, all right. That was enough of that. Well, <laughs> welcome. So, uh, as you heard, this is going to be a TV show. So, it's Good Morning CSL. Uh, that was sort of good. Let's try it again. Good Morning CSL. Awesome. Well, welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living. I thought, you know, we take spirituality way too seriously. I mean, you know what I mean? And God is joy. So what uh, another way to start out a morning show is by a couple of jokes. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you that there was a woman that was admitted to the hospital, and she died on the operating table. And when she died, she immediately met God, like all of us do. And in the process of meeting God, she said, is my time up? And God looked at her and said, no, you still have another 40 years, two months, and eight days. She was so excited. And when she came back, too, she thought, hell, if I'm going to be here for a while, I'm going to get some work done. So she had a facelift, a tummy tuck, some liposuction. I mean, she even had a hairdresser come in and change her hair color. Okay, she was looking fine. And when she left the hospital, she was walking across the street, Bam, she got hit by a car. Immediately met God and she said, what happened? And God said, oh, I didn't recognize you. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know. How many of you know Mahatma Gandhi? You know that, great. You know, he was a very amazing mystic, but he walked in bare feet for miles, causing him to have some very hard and callous feet. He also starved himself often to make a point, but it caused him to be a little frail and thin. You know, the thing about him is some said that he was a super callous, fragile mystic hex with halitosis. 
All right, enough with the jokes. So today, we have some very special guests for you, but before we do, they say you should get your body into it. So, come on, let's stand on up and let's boogie. Get up, come on. Boogie down. Come on, give it up. Give it up. I have to say, you've got to love this band. <laughs> so, I'm going to let you know, we have some very special guests today, just for your pleasure and enlightenment. <laughs> Sounds good? Well, I would love to have you, as each of them come out, give them a really warm welcome. The first woman I'd like to introduce had a virgin birth. Not only did she have a virgin birth, she went through the trials and tribulations of watching the end of her son's life. I'd like us all to welcome Mother Mary. Hello, Mother Mary. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice to have you with us here today. Thank you. I was I'm wondering, happy to be here. you know, what is it like to have an immaculate conception? Well, Harold, can I call you that? Of course. It's lonely. <laughs> lonely. You're by yourself. Oh. The Holy Spirit comes over you. Mm. Anybody else ever had the Holy Spirit come into the room and feel very lonely? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, Mother Mary, what caused you to say yes to that call? Well, Harold, you know, I was just sitting there, and I heard this call. It said, Mary... Be open and receptive. Oh, speaking of calls, I've got to return a call. Do you mind? Oh, no, I'm sure it's we're fine It's very important. With that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold, please. We all get calls. Oh, Mary, you have a cell phone. That's pretty Hello? Up. Hello? Yes, is Paul McCartney there? Oh, Paul. Hi, Paul. It's Mother Mary. It's Paul McCartney? Do you yes, yes, I know. It's been a long time since you called. Let it be and all those things. Yes, that's right. Let it be. You're welcome. That was a great line. I do admit. So what's your problem now? You're, you turned 75? Well, that's so young, Paul. No, 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 no. Don't get a facelift. Or walk across the street. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Here's the words of wisdom. Moisturize. Ah. Okay, just moisturize. It'll be fine. Okay, got to go now. Bye-bye. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay, I'll say it one more time. Words of wisdom. Let it be. Wow. Let you it be, Mother Mary. Let it be. Thank you. Thank I'm you so, so sorry. much. We didn't mind that little piece there. I am wondering. It was a long way for a joke, but I tried. <laughs> oh, Mother Mary. I, you know, I'm wondering, what was it like to watch your son during the final stages of his life? Well... I learned to listen to the Holy Spirit, as I told you before, and to trust God with an open heart. I knew that God had a plan for his life, even though it was troubled at times, I must admit. Mm -hmm. But I knew that he had his path. I had to follow my heart. I had to listen and trust God. That's what I did. 
That's beautiful, Mother Mary. We just have a quick time with you. So I just want to thank Mother Mary for oh. coming today. Thank, thank you, bless you, you all. so much. Would you like a hug? Oh. You know, I have to say, how many of us get a call? Get a call from Spirit. And have the ability to say yes. And even when we do say yes, that if it doesn't work out the way we had planned it to work out, we tend to fall back and not trust that Spirit has a plan for us. That Spirit is good to have the faith in knowing what we believe, that God is good and so are we. You know, I think about the two modes of spiritual practice, which we're going to look at today. One being receptive, the other being directive. And they both are important. But where are we with the balance in, in, in both of them? So our next guest really was another example of that receptivity. And so I'd like to give a warm welcome to Buddha. <laughs> welcome, Buddha. Namaste, Harold. Please take a seat. Hold. <laughs> You're old. Oh, getting in lotus position. That's always can be difficult. I, I have to say, pe people said that you were a prince in Nepal and that you had to give up or decided really to give up everything to seek out this enlightenment. I'm wondering, what called you to do that? It is what I was called to do. The way is not in the sky. The way is not in the sky. It is in the heart. The way is not in the sky. How many of us think it is? How many of us think that the sky is going to open up and tell us what to do? Instead, there's a way within the heart, the heart that can communicate to us. I'm wondering, Buddha, what, what else would you like to really share with us today before we say goodbye to you? It is better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then victory is truly yours. And then only then you can do what you need to do and be with yourself. Mm. Thank you so much, Buddha. Let's give Buddha <laughs> Namaste. So now, of course, we can learn so much from spiritual masters. And what does it matter if they lived thousands of years ago if we're not living the example that they taught today? So that was purely a receptive side. The ability to open up and to hear what's within our heart. Because when we know ourselves, that's power. Anybody ever notice that? When we know ourselves, that's power, divine power. Power that lets us know that we have the right to declare something and to have faith in how it will turn out. So as we look at that one side, that receptive piece, we have to ask, how do we practice the receptive side of being in spiritual practice? And we'll get to that. I want to talk about the other side of the coin, which is that directive side, which we've all been taught in some way or in some form. A directive place to be able to say, I'm going to speak my word, let there be, claim, declare, into the universe what it is that I desire, or the law in that creative process that we like to talk about, that unformed substance of when we speak it to when it manifests or demonstrates in form. So let's take a look at the other side, that directive side of spiritual practice. 
And I can't think of another person who's better than the founder of the Centers for Spiritual Living, a man who actually spoke his word, declared what he would like. Let's give a warm welcome to Ernest Holmes. Hello, Ernest. How are you? There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life. Wow, that was profound, but I didn't ask you anything. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Ernest, what would you say about this one life? There is power in the universe, and you can use it. Oh, there's a power in the universe, and we can use it. And that's from living and being in that one life, where we all are. There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life, too. Hmm. Thank you so much, Ernest. Let's give him a warm... <laughs> Thank you, Ernest. You want a hug? There is one life, which is the life of that divine that lives and breathes and has its being within each and every one of us. And when we know that place from a deep place of conviction, we can claim what we desire, what we want in our life. For some of us, we do that, and some of us, maybe not so. But looking at that other side gives us a place of recognizing, geez, there's two ways of being here. They're both appropriate. They're both valid. So I'm going to ask another teacher to come out. She was known as the teacher of teachers. She was Ernest Holmes' teacher. She was also Charles Fillmore, who actually founded Unity, as well as with his wife. This is that directive side, and there's no better woman than Ernest, uh, Emma Curtis Hopkins to explain that to us. Hello, Emma. <laughs> Hello, Emma. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's what Emma did to a lot of her students. She didn't talk to them sometimes for months. They would come on in, sit down like Ernest Holmes, and they would keep looking at her talking, wondering what's going on, what's happening. Wanting you to become aware of the thoughts that are happening within your own mind as she held a high watch. Emma, you know that you're on the Good Morning Show, right? Yes, of course. And might I just take a moment to say what a wonderful student Ernest was. Look what he's done. Yes, truly. Thanks to someone you're teaching. I'm wondering, you often claim that there's a good for you. Yes. Well, how would you define that good? Well, Harold, do you, do you have a desire within your own heart? Well, yes. That's your good. Oh. You have to speak it. You have to name it so that you can claim it. There's a good for you, and you ought to have it. There's a good for me as well as everyone here. Everyone here. There's a good for you, and you ought to have it. Let me see. Guitar man, rise up. 
Name your good. Perfect. That is his now. Souls through music. Healing souls that through is music. Wonderful. Now he can claim it. Claim it. Emma, thank you so much for those words of wisdom. You're welcome. So you've seen two different modes of being, and really they all encompass them. We all encompass them every single day. But do we actually listen to the call? Are we actually open and receptive to what's happening within our own heart, within our own lives? to recognize that from that directive place, to be able to say, hey, this is the good that I desire, and I ought to have it. Every single one of us has the right and the ability to be able to say, this is my good and I'm going to claim it. Now, this shows up in so many ways. Do you know it's actually that receptive and directive side to me actually even shows up in your breath? just the way you breathe. I'll tell you a story about that. There was a yoga instructor who was actually teaching his yoga classes, all the yoga poses, and he's walking around watching all of his students. And he notices one woman in the front breathing a little unusually. And so as he walks by her, he says to her, oh, you great giving, suck receiving. And he walks by. Now the woman is like, excuse me. And she's thinking about it the whole time in her class. Uh, what did he say to me? Why did he say that? Is it something that I'm wearing? Is it the way that I'm, am I sweating too much? What, what, what does that mean? that I'm great at giving and I suck at receiving. And she was upset. And she held on to it to the very end of the class. And then she goes up to him and she says, I want to know what that means. What what means? Why you said that to me? I said what? Why you said that I am great at giving and suck at receiving? Oh, just your breath. She said, what? He said, yeah, you breathe like this. Exhale is that directive part of our breath. If we take a moment right now to take a look at how am I breathing, can I inhale to be receptive enough to know the truth of my being? You know, we're really good, at least as far as what I can see in society, that we're really good about doing things. That's directive. I mean doing things and doing things and doing things, right? You've got to do this in order to get the job. You've got to do that in order to get the partner. You've got to do this in order to receive the perfect job. But whatever it is, do this, do that. Why? So I can have something. So I can get that relationship that makes me feel whole. I can get that job that will make me feel accomplished. And then I can be somebody. Now, that's one way to live life, which is directive. And there's the other side of being receptive, of being open enough to know that the very truth of who we are is spiritual at its essence, and nothing and no one can ever change that. 
Nothing and no one can ever change the absolute truth of your spiritual being, that you are whole, that you are perfect, that you are complete. I have to remember that sometimes. And the way to do it is to disconnect from the doing. Because when I do that, then, then, what happens? When I simply be, then the doing shows up for me. It's like, okay, I know who I am. I know what my heart's desire is. I know that I am one with that infinite nature and that I should have everything that I, my heart desires, just like each and every one of us. But from that place, I move into then doing. The being allows me to move into the doing. And then the have shows up. The being allows me to know what to do from an intuitive place. You know, that's what Ernest Holmes called your communication with God, your intuition. It doesn't need any studies. It doesn't need another book, another self-help book. It knows infinitely the absolute truth of who we are. And when we know that place, the doing happens. So I have a story for you. How many of you remember 2001? Oh, not bad. Good. It's not that far, really. I know some of you are a lot younger, but you know, there was a time where I really wanted a home. I would sit in meditation and say, I want a home. That was my heart's desire. I wanted a feeling of safety and security, a place that I could feel I could put my roots in. Now, for 25 years, I had worked in dentistry. And so for me to just manage a dental office, I used to work three to four days a week because we'd alternate on Saturdays. It wasn't a lot. But when I heard within myself that that is what my heart desired, first thing I did was I heard it. I heard the call. I knew that's what I wanted was then I took the action. And what was the action for me? Oh, I'm going to get a real estate agent. How about a mortgage broker? Now, I will tell you, there were lots of naysayers along the way. You know what I mean by that? You can't do it. Matter of fact, that's exactly what this real estate agent told me. She said, you know what? You're not going to find a place in Seattle. She goes, you just can't do it with your income. What? I remember actually saying to her, do you believe in prayer? <laughs> she was like, well, yeah. I said, well, start praying. <laughs> I mean, uh, someone is putting a limitation on us. Could you imagine the limitations that Mary went through? Saying yes to being pregnant in a time that they could possibly stone you to death? How about Buddha to give up everything, all the riches that he had in the palace life? But something within him knew that this is what he needed to do to find enlightenment. So back to the mortgage and home story. Well, that wasn't the only person who told me no. The mortgage broker said the same thing to me. There's no way you can do this. I said, why not? I'm listening. She says, well, you really don't have enough saved, and you don't really have enough income, and I don't think it's a good idea. I talked to the, the, the real estate agent. She was saying, maybe you should move further north. I don't want to live further north. Maybe you should live further south. I don't want to live further south. I want Seattle. She said, okay. So next day, I went back to my meditation. What is it that I'm supposed to do? Once again, listening. Message I got, take out two loans. Do an 80% loan and a 20% loan. That way you avoid property mortgage insurance. Now, that doesn't happen anymore these days. But that's exactly what I did. 
when I told the mortgage broker, get me two loans. She said, what do you mean? I said, I want one loan for 80%, I want the other loan for 20%. She says, wow, I'll try that. You have a great credit score. I said, good, then let them use that as a place to look at how, how valuable I am and not my income. We could try that. So she went on her way to do it. As I'm driving by, going to Ballard, because that's the place I used to live, I was going to Ballard, anybody know Ballard? I'm driving by and I'm go going past one street and something says, turn right here. I'm like, really? O okay. So I turn right here. As I go down that street, I see my house. I knew it was my house. Something inside me told me, that's your home. So I got out, pulled up the flyer, went, oh, they're asking 110,000 more than what I thought, but oh well. I walked around, took a look at it, called my real estate agent, she said to me, you what? Found a house in Seattle? I said, yeah, but that's more than you can, I don't know, I'll ask them for less. Ask them for 110,000 less. She's like, are you sure? I'm like, what is it gonna hurt to ask? So I asked, and they made a counteroffer. They were willing to drop the price by $100,000. That was unheard of. I was listening to what was happening within me and doing something about it. Receptive, directive. To make a long story short, I couldn't get into the house for an extra two weeks than I thought, so I had to stay with friends. But that house, I bought. And I didn't just buy the house. The real estate agent and the mortgage broker felt so bad that the house didn't go through when it said it was going to go through, they gave me $1,000 back from their commission. So not only did I buy the house, I also got $1,000 with nothing down, except for knowing that I was going to follow my heart. Now it doesn't matter if it's a house if it's a relationship, if it's an occupation that you want. What we need to hold on to is that we are divine. And when we sit in that presence and know the absolute truth of who we are, we will be led to our next step. Because I'll tell you something, I was exhausted from doing. Do you know what I mean? Do this, do that, do this, get another job. When you get another job, you'll get more income. Then you have to do this, and then you have to do this, and then you have to save, so you better go. It was like I was like, enough. And the only way I know how to stop that sometimes is to listen, is to be, is to be in that receptive place so how do we become more receptive? One is you can take a look at me right now and say, how many ears and how many mouths do I have? <laughs> Two ears, one mouth. Can I do more listening? Listening to my family, listening to my friends, listening to that voice within me that says, yes, you can. What's the next one? Is to be receptive and open. How do you do that? You, I can look around and see people just by your body language. Are you being receptive and open? Or are we closed off? Now, that's not to say that there's a judgment there. It's a place of being self-aware. Another place is take a breath. <gasps> is meditation. 
Nobody's run out yet. <laughs> Meditation, the opportunity to just sit and be. I have seen more of my thoughts through meditation than anything else sometimes. And when I recognize it, it encourages me to do something about it or to let it go. So those are three things. You know, there was a Harvard study that actually showed that people who meditated had greater self-awareness, had greater compassion, and had a decreased amount of stress. Anybody want to sign up for that? <laughs> I'm not saying you have to spend eight hours in being receptive, but can we even move from this place and watch just with our breath Am I receiving when somebody gives me something, a hug, or am I blocking it away? Am I constantly <gasps> exhaling, to or am I having the opportunity to breathe in? Ernest Holmes said something really powerful that I love, which was, I believe in God, so I believe in myself. And I want to expand that, because I believe in God, so I believe in each and every one of you. Because I know the truth of your being, and the truth of your being is spirit, always and forever. Let's pray. So I invite you to just take that breath in, to become open and receptive, to become aware that there is absolutely one life, that life that lives and breathes and has its being within us. And as I recognize that life, I recognize that there is an infinite wisdom available to us always. For it does not matter what we have done before or where we're going to, that presence is always available to us. That presence of love, that presence of kindness, of joy, and so I take this time to open up and to revel in the awareness that Spirit is exactly where I am, exactly where we are, exactly beautiful, perfect, whole, and complete. There is nothing missing in God and there is nothing missing in us. And so I take this time to duplicate that nature of spirit, to breathe in and allow that infinite wisdom to come to me, to be receptive in knowing that there is a good within our hearts and that we ought to have that. And so I declare right now that just as nothing can stop God, nothing can stop the absolute truth of our being. And that truth is our very own heart's desire that does not harm us or anyone else. The truth in knowing that we are that place where God shows up. And for that, I give thanks. I give thanks in knowing that who we are is divine, perfect, complete, and I release these words knowing that we have asked and we shall receive. And together I invite you to say with me, and so it is. <laughs>